they're constantly sort of uh, you know, blindsided by these attacks. So it, it seems to me that in some senses we're working on the same, the same basic issue, which is that be, these guys are using academia in ways that are just unacceptable. So then my question is, because at least what I think we should do with the media is go on a campaign of Ocheach Tochiach uh, Etik Shaltecha. You will surely rebuke your media. I think we should. Do you think it's possible to uh, engage in a campaign that's more aggressive than we've done so far, in which we say, look, you universities are failing. You're failing your students. You're failing the public. You're failing, you're failing the civil society that's given birth to you. I think it's a you know it's a good question. It, it's in a way it is parallel to the issue with the media, and it's what you went through with Lebanon. It's a, it's a form of asymmetric warfare. Yeah. You know they're fighting by different rules than we're fighting, and the question is you know do we want to fight by the same rules as them? And in some cases maybe we have to. In the case of uh, dealing with some of these things on the academic side, it's very it's very hard. Uh, give you one example. Uh, there's something called the Palestine Solidarity Movement Conference that's been going on now for five years. And uh, there's a lot of debate about what to do about it. Basically, it's a group of you know, three to 500 students, depending on the year, who get together. They all hate Israel. They get in the room together and tell each other how much they hate Israel. And there are a lot of people who are concerned that this will have a greater impact beyond those three or five hundred students who, who go in the classroom, and there are some pretty nefarious things that go on there, like they have workshops about how to infiltrate public schools, and you know, there, there, are some, there are some problematic things about it. You could argue that, you know, let's ignore it, because it's, it's not going to attract much attention. The more we, attention we give it, the more attention it'll get from the media and from the campus, uh, and while they're having their one conference a year, with their 500 students, you know, APAC and Stand With Us and Jewish National Fund and American Jewish Committee and all the other Jewish organizations are having dozens and dozens of conferences with thousands of students, and it's a much bigger impact. But uh, I also believe that we have to take a stand, that we have to say this is unacceptable, that if there was a, a, uh, a conference promoting uh, the values of the Klan, no university in America would allow it, and uh, Jesse Jackson and, uh, and Al Sharpton would be down there ready to burn down a university if it was permitted, and the same with other hot issues, and especially if they involve uh, uh, minority. I mean, look at uh, Larry Summers got run out of Harvard University in part because of a comment he made, which uh, may have not have been very wise, uh, having to do with women, uh, that you couldn't say make that kind of a remark. But... When it comes to Jews, you can. So this Palestine Solidarity Movement had its uh, last conference at Georgetown University. And I argued in the Jewish uh, community in Washington, we should be saying this is unacceptable. A, a university should not host a group who says that uh, terrorism is permissible. Uh, and you had this whole uh, series of things that you had to sign on to if you wanted to participate. Not, that's not what university is for. That's not scholarship. There's no academic value. But I was, you know, more than overruled. It was uh, almost unanimous, except me, in the rest of the Jewish community, that no, we don't want to make a big deal out of this. The university's handling it okay. You know, we're going to trade this off with other things we're going to try to get from the university. And so the decision was made to let it, to let it go and not to make a big issue. So there's a, there's a debate. There are some people in the community, you know, it's like, it's like Israel. There are some people who are more militant about the, the approach they want to take, and others who, who have still the Shastil uh, attitude, and I think that's still the dominant uh, paradigm. Yeah. Um, this is an unbelievable litany of horror that you presented us with, but those of us who deal with it, and I do uh, a, a lot with it. Why do you um, identify yourself? Uh, Frida Keat is my name. I do quite a bit of lecturing abroad mainly to evangelical Christians these days, because they just love Israel, and it's, a, it's like being in a lovely warm bath. Um, I've just spent several months in Canada, uh, in Montreal, and what is going on on Concordia is just absolutely terrifying. Um, my question would be, uh, and I think that those of us who deal with this are constantly obsessed with this, so what then, was it Tolstoy who said, so what then can I do? Perhaps most horrifying to me in what you said was your description of the school that your children go to, where there is no teaching of Israel. I mean, this surely is where it begins. And my question to you is, what in hell did you do about that? 
Uh, we actually we had a meeting fairly recently with the headmaster to try to to try to get them to uh, change things, and uh, we're not making headway as quickly as I want. They now have a couple of courses on Israel. They bought my book myths and facts. They buy it. I gave them copies of my book myths and facts to give to every senior before they go to Israel. Uh, we're going to be continuing to push them. There's a movement not just from my school, but there's a broader uh, effort. Uh, across the country to introduce a pro, uh, not pro Israel, but a, a curriculum about Israel into high schools and day schools uh, because there isn't one now, or there are, there's a multiplicity of not very good ones. So there's a there's more and more attention being paid to this, but not still not nearly enough, and it's still not uh, percolating through as much as it needs to. But there are a number of schools that are doing a much better job. Uh, you talk about the Christians, I actually. One of the things I'm going to be doing in L.A. is meeting with some people there who uh, are, have hired me to write a textbook on the history of Israel for high school students and especially aimed at <coughs> Catholic schools, which they have developed a relationship with. But it's a, look, it's a huge problem, and it's something that the Jewish community in America has totally neglected for decades, that we just didn't pay attention. You know, and I was shocked. When I started giving lectures, you know, typically I would lecture in colleges, but then I started giving some talks in, in day schools and high schools, and I was shocked to discover that a day school wouldn't teach about Israel, and that I could ask students some fairly rudimentary questions about the history and politics of Israel or about the, the uh, confrontational issues, and they won't know the answer. And the teachers, I mean, the teachers don't know the answer, so they can't teach it. I mean, the teachers in day schools don't know enough. But, you know, slowly, slowly, we're going to start making a difference. There's a, there are some people who are giving seminars for teachers to try to teach them how to teach. And, uh, it's, a, it's something we need to focus on. Um, your opening remarks, you said that young people today don't know uh, any existential danger to Israel. Um, I understand what you mean in terms of the historical pro progression young people work. But today, there is a very great existential danger to Israel. It's from Iran. Right? And Iran connects that existential danger with the Shoah, right? by denying the Shoah. So isn't there a way of interesting, at least in some elementary way, in terms of their own survival, in terms of Jewish survival, connection between the Shoah, Israel today, the Jewish people in danger, the demographic danger, to put it all together, not complicated to understand, and to repeat <coughs> the message over and over again so that there is an awakening. And to also connect that some way with their own position in the United States, because as we know, within the United States also, there are voices in which the American Jewish community and American Jews are subjected to criticism, the neocons, for instance, in a way they have never been before. Things are permitted to be written and to be spoken in a way they never have before. Well, uh, I mean, it's a good, good point, and uh, hopefully uh, everyone will buy my new book, Will Israel Survive?, which actually will lay out all of this uh, in the way you're, you're talking about. Uh, there is a, an effort, you know, especially among the more political Jewish groups like AIPAC, that are heavily focusing on Iran, and it's not clear to me that students are fully appreciating the Iranian threat. Uh, Jewish students, somewhat. Liberals, <coughs> liberal Jewish students, hardly at all, and non-Jews, probably, definitely not at all. I mean, a lot, you know, you got to understand the way the Iran, you know, most of you have probably been to the States fairly often, and, may, and maybe recently enough, that you would see that uh, the way a lot of people are seeing the whole debate about Iran is it's Iraq all over again. You know, they're selling us a bill of goods, you know, okay, we're going through the alphabet of, uh, you know, we, we meant to do Iran first, we, it's, it's actually first in the alphabet, we did Iraq by accident, we're going to now do Iran. Uh, so the, there's a lot of that feeling that that this is just uh, more of the same of what we got into in Iraq. This is going to be an even bigger mess. Why should we believe anybody when they say uh, Iran's building nuclear <coughs> weapons? Look at the bill of goods we were sold on Iraq. 
it, it's just that's part of the the political environment at the moment. Jewish students, I think, are a little bit more sensitive to the the, the possibility and the realities and recognize it as a threat to Israel, but it's still not, I don't think there's enough of an appreciation at the level that you're talking about, but it's, it is one potential way in that we otherwise didn't have. I would also connect it in another way in with this, is through the whole fundamental Islamic threat. It's in the news every day, whether coming from Australia or from Great Britain, the whole perception of a world which is hostile, not simply to Israel, fundamental Western values, to put the two things together and to make it clear that it's not Israel alone, but Israel and Western civilization, which are endangered by this kind of thinking, this whole trend in the world, the terror, the fundamental Islam, altogether. But again, you have to keep in mind the American, especially campus context, which tends to be very liberal in its outlook and universalistic that there is a great resistance to the notion that there is this con this war of civilizations. It's, you know, the, the emphasis on a college campus is we're all the same, we can all get along, let's look for dialogue. Now, I'm not against dialogue by any means, but it, it's, it's a resistance and a reluctance to see the world in, in the way that I think you accurately describe it. There's more of a tendency to, to not, to be very resistant to that that worldview and to want to see it as, no, they're really not all that bad, we can work together, we can find a way, and especially on the campus, talking will make it all better. I would like to ask, at the same time that you are in trying to endow chairs in universities, bring in visiting professors and the like, is there an attempt to bring printed material onto campuses so that Jewish students and anyone who's interested will have resources available to make sure there are books in the library, fact sheets in the hands of student organizations and the like? Uh, well, that's one of the things I do. That's why I do myths and facts. Well, what's uh, we do fact the sheets. These are all go to the campuses. Okay. But the sad reality is that it's students really don't read books. It's got to be on the internet. If it's not on the internet, it doesn't exist. I have an office that sort of has bookshelves like this, and I would ask an intern to look something up, some subject. And they <coughs> After two hours, they'd say, I'm sorry, I can't find an answer. I'd say, did you turn around and look at the book on the third shelf there that, you know, I'm sure has the answer? It wouldn't occur to them. Or to pick up the telephone and call someone. You know, we live in Washington where all the experts on you know, policy issues are. No one would think to call up, you know, the State Department and see if there was someone there who could answer a particular question. That's why I created the Jewish Virtual Library, this website, was in 1997. I came to this this uh, epiphany that students don't read. And so I said, if they want to know about Israel, what are they going to do? They're going to look on the internet. And first of all, there was very little about Israel. What was there was hard to find. And what was hard to find was, wasn't very good. And so I said, I want to have a one-stop shop where a student can find everything they want to know about Israel. And then I thought, well, what if they want to know about the Holocaust or anti-Semitism or Jewish holidays? The same problem. So I created this monster for myself that now I have to know every, you know, have everything about everything. So the Jewish Virtual Library now has 13,000 articles on everything from anti-Semitism to Zionism. But we do try. For example, you know, I don't have a copy of Myths and Facts with me. Some people say, uh, you know, I'm an older, uh, older uh, activist, and they'll say, oh, yeah, I have a copy of Myths and Facts, the 75 edition, the 1980 edition. It used to be this big. You know, how did it get to be this big? I say, you know, if the Arabs would quit making myths, I wouldn't have to quit making new facts. <laughs> but then someone said, you know, kids today, they won't read a book that thick. We need something shorter. So I, I wish I had a copy with it. So we came out with a little spiral version that's this big that we call On One Foot. Uh, and the, the Middle, Middle East Guide to the Perplexed, or What to Say to Your Friend When They Go to an Anti-Israel Rally, something like that's the subtitle. You know, so I had to boil we need, down. We need Israel for dummies. That's the model. <laughs> oh, careful. Careful. That's the wrong model. Yes. The complete idiot's guide. Yeah. That's my book. <laughs> the dummies are the other guys. <laughs> that guy who wrote that book is terrible. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's an interesting story. I don't know if you'll find it interesting. But you know, I wrote the book, The Complete Idiot's Guide to Middle East Conflict. And one of the reasons I wrote it, you know, why would I want to have my name on a book called The Idiot's Guide? But I thought, 
uh, I, start, I got started in this writing a book on World War II. I said, why should I be a senior? I'd like to think of myself as a scholar, an academic, and why do I want my name on an idiot's guide? And then I thought, who's going to read the book on the idiot's guide to World War II? It's going to be you know, an average person who doesn't know anything, maybe curious, interested. And if somebody else other than me writes that book, I am positive it's going to have a paragraph or a few sentences on the Holocaust. And I want to be sure that that audience that reads those kinds of books is going to learn about the Holocaust. So I'm going to write that book. So I have you know, two chapters out of you know, the whole war I deal with issues related to the Holocaust. And then we said, we, you know, they said, what are you interested in? What else you want to do? So I said, the Middle East conflict. And it's the same thing. It's reaching an audience that otherwise, you know, that's not going to read Tom Friedman's book, certainly isn't going to read Martin Gilbert's book, but it's, it's going to reach an audience. So I got a call out of the blue one day from this guy, a Jewish guy. He says, you know, this is kind of awkward for me, but I really liked your idiot's guy, and now I've been hired to write the dummy's guy, you know, the competition. <laughs> and I, I, I'm trying to write a book that also is going to be, you know, factual and... and be uh, positive toward Israel, and I keep having these problems that they have this Lebanese professor as the editor, and he keeps changing everything I write, and he was in this uh, horrible dilemma, and I didn't know what to tell him. I said, you know, you got to try your best to get the, uh, the facts in there, and, you know, if it's not going to work, you shouldn't write it, and in the end, he, his name's not on the book. I don't know what ultimately happened, but the book that came out isn't uh, anything like mine, so uh, that's, that's part, of the, part of the problem we deal with. I, uh, I would like to follow up what has been uh, already mentioned, but in a more general way. Uh, I was not surprised to hear about the problem of lack of understanding about Israel or what Israel has done in the last 58 years. I was on uh, American campuses. In fact, I was even sent by the Zionist, the WZO, years ago to Berkeley, and I was astonished, astonished, but this was not much of a big surprise to me because uh, as a boy coming to the United States from Libya, uh, at Brandeis, I went and taught Hebrew school. And what I found out was that their knowledge of Jewish history is zilt. I mean, really, I mean, was very, very surprising, especially from a boy that I wouldn't say was very... Uh, knowledgeable so much about Jewish history in Libya, but nonetheless, you see, I, I discovered certain things that I couldn't believe. Um, so I think, what I mean, for example, what CAGE is doing in terms of preparing, I mean, when we get students at university that they don't know how to write a paper, we say, which high school you went to? I mean, what kind of stuff you are bringing along with you? You see, I'm saying the same thing. I mean, you know, these people have gone to college, Never mind orthodox reform, conservative movements, or whatever, you know. But CAGE is having its conferences every year about Jewish education curriculum. What is in this curriculum? You mentioned 133 courses, okay? What is the mo modern Jewish history courses? What do they include? For example, the history of Jews in Arab countries that I have been involved for the last 30 years, okay, can be a fantastic you know, side to all this garbage that we are getting about Islam and about Arabism and Pan-Arabism and so on and so forth. I'm just finishing my book on the Jews of Libya, and I'm telling you, the 1967 war, the more I see American Jewish Committee uh, archives and other archives from Italy and so on, it's, it's something unbelievable that these, this information has not been, uh, 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 you know, uh, disseminated uh, in Jewish campuses, uh, I mean, yeah. in, in Jewish schools and American university campuses. Okay. One of the things I've learned since I'm here is this is not unique to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, someone was telling me the other day in uh, Tel Aviv that she asked one of her uh, Israeli students, you know, what's the Altalina? And they said, well, it's a nightclub in Tel Aviv. Oh. So, uh, uh, I'm sure I know that there are problems, uh, not just in, in American schools, but I think there's a, there's a couple of problems. One is a time issue. That, you know, a day school in the United States, they split teaching uh, American secular mm -hmm. subjects and, and Judaic yeah. subjects. 
and they constantly feel under the gun that they don't have enough time to do all the things they want and need to do, and, and it's even worse in after-school Hebrew schools, obviously, they have even less time, which is where the majority of uh, Jewish kids, I think, get their Jewish education. So there's a basic time problem, and then there's a, a, a kind of feeling that we are, we're sort of doing it by osmosis. That from kindergarten through 12th grade, you know, we're, we're celebrating the holidays and, you know, we have a map of Israel on the wall and we do talk about, you know, some of the things, but it's not taught in the way that, you know, as a political scientist and a guy working as an advocate on campus thinks it needs to be taught in terms of training them how to answer uh, the, the things that are said and that they read about in the newspaper. It's, it's more of this, you know, Jewish history and life culture. And it's also what the kids are more comfortable with. And, and there's, a, there's also a great fear of teaching about politics. At my, again, in my kids' school, uh, the Bible teacher, I think this was last year, the Bible teacher said she was teaching the book of uh, Samuel, Solomon, <coughs> dealing with uh, David and Goliath. And uh, uh, I said, uh, you know, that takes place in the area <coughs> near what's today the Gaza Strip and you now we just had this somewhat important event happen in Israel, the disengagement. This might be an opportunity to bring that you know, up in the way. So I, I could never do that. I can't talk about politics at all. <laughs> and, and, and this was part of the discussion. You, you asked me about, did I talk to, did we talk to my school about it? And said, yeah, there's this fear. You, you know, there's not a monolithic view of Israel in, uh, among parents, and uh, some of them will go nuts if they think that the, their kids are being taught a particular point of view about Israel that they disagree with. So there's that political correctness and, and fear also. Is this, a, excuse me, just, a, just one sentence. Is this a fear of, of the Jewish parents because their kids might make aliyah to Israel? No, I don't think uh -huh. very many. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, Mitch, uh, I, I didn't want to to put in all kinds of uh, big questions uh, pertaining to this, but uh, there is a, a detail that did not escape my attention, which I think is a little bit worrying. Uh, you mentioned accidentally in your speech that you were writing a book entitled Will Israel Survive? And th I thought this is exactly the most counterproductive thing one can do because that raises the doubt in the, in the minds of young people and others. What does it mean, will Israel survive? I mean, uh, do you have any doubts about it? No, my argument, my argument is uh, you know, to, to look at all the serious challenges that Israel faces and to try to explain to people why Israel can survive despite the challenges and uh, to, look at, to look at the situation in the Middle East in the way that people don't in terms of uh, the complexity of it in dealing with history, psychology, religion, uh, and all of its uh, complexity. Yeah, it's a, it's a provocative title because it's going to try to sell books. It would be better if it didn't have the question mark on the end in terms of, you know, if, if it would just said Israel will survive, would have been a, you know, a, a better title for uh, feeling good about it, but not... Uh, the survival of it? It's... it's uh, uh, you know that uh, this whole war against Israel on campus began in Europe. I was Shaliach uh, in France, and we discovered that uh, certain methods can work better than really expected. We sent all our students to the most anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic lectures, uh, and they attended. When they attended these courses, they became very active Zionists. Uh, on the other hand, we asked them to record the course. And once this course was published, it was a scandal. And you know that Faurisson in Lyon, who was one of the first negationist uh, uh, professor who negated the Holocaust, was kicked out of the <coughs> university because the students complained. When you see a lecturer uh, speak anti-Semitic uh, uh, words or anti-Zionist and 30 students go out of the room and go directly to complain to the board. It makes such a scandal that the board cannot ignore it. And I think that we should encourage 
our students to follow these courses and be really uh, the, the, uh, the active part of the fight against them. On the other hand, uh, you know that the Jewish community in the United States and Canada is guilty because we came 15 years, 20 years ago to the United States and Canada and said, look, look how it works. It's coming to your campuses and in Montreal in particular. And uh, the community said, come on. The United States or Canada are the best friends of Israel. It cannot happen here. They didn't prepare the students. They didn't know that the students have a very important role to play in this fight, more than any institution. On the other hand, I think that we spend millions of dollars to bring young people to Israel. Like, for example, uh, in birthright. But you know that in birthright, it is forbidden to do any session on Israel advocacy, because it's politics. That's we are supposed to teach history, but not uh, but actual I, I, problems. First on the birthright ban, they have specific advocacy missions. Uh, and I can tell you that birthright is probably the best thing ever invented by anybody for the Jewish people. I agree. In terms no, of bringing, when students bringing come for a year, I think there should be more courses, serious yeah, courses on Israel advocacy. But in terms of the... Even in yeshivot, yeah. Yavne Olami is doing it now. Yeah. In every yeshiva there is a course on Israel advocacy. No, I agree. But in terms of the students dealing with the, the campuses, first of all, uh, this is something I thought was, which students should be doing, taping lectures and doing things like that. You can't take a lecture in most classes. You can try to do it surreptitiously, but if you don't have the professor's permission, you're not supposed to be doing it. Uh, and there's a, a, a Columbia, for example, after the Balagan there, when the university did its uh, investigation, uh, which was a, largely a whitewash, a lot of the thing talked about sort of outside agitators uh, getting involved in the process and students spying on each other and students going to professors to spy on their colleagues. And there was this whole notion that uh, monitoring what's going on in the classroom is somehow illegitimate. And I think it's ridiculous. I think you have every right to be able to say, what, this is what's being said in the classroom, and then is this a legitimate uh, scholarly uh, academic discourse? And if it's not, it should be challenged. Uh, but it's very difficult. I mean, if you go and you complain about a syllabus or you complain about things in the campus, it's very difficult, given academic freedom, to have much done about it unless it's so egregious. And you know, in Columbia, the guy who was at the center of the storm there is up for tenure now, and he's probably going to get it. The rule Last against, round. I, I, I appreciate it's right on this subject. Yeah. The rule against being able to um, take teach, teachers, professors' lectures should be questioned in the courts. It's outrageous that a professor can say, "I don't want anybody outside of my class hearing what I have to say." Last um, I manage a website called Israel Academia Monitor. And uh, I can say that much of the problem actually comes from within, uh, from the Jewish community itself, the Israeli community. Uh, I think we are helping our enemies uh, a lot. And we, I think we, we should find a solution for this. I mean, perhaps you know, if they both boycott us, we should boycott them. Uh, um, individual, individual professors who are boycotting or calling for the, for the boycott of Israel should be boycotted, I suppose. I suppose. And there's a lot of things that we should actually do. We Israeli, we Jews, we, we have to sort of uh, look within first, I think. Well, I, I, certainly no question about the problems in Israel's academic, uh, among some of the problems you have with your scholars, but uh, I have a hard enough time dealing with Americans. I'm not going to even start to try to deal with your problems. Hi, I have two questions. Um, first is, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it seems to me that in a post-9-11 world, it's pretty clear that the enemies of Israel on campus are really enemies of the West. And I'm curious where in the work on behalf of Israel we attend to sort of resuscitating kids' understanding of Western values such as sovereignty, the line between free, spe uh, excuse me, free speech and treason, um, the notion of a just war. So that would be the first question. The second question is um, where do the politics of oil fit into this? Well, uh, let me deal with the politics of oil. Don't I think enter the classroom directly, it's more indirectly through the money 
of the oil producing nations, which then goes into these chairs and centers and so forth, uh, and other lobbying activities that the, the Arab producers do. In terms of the focus on values, the most frustrating thing, probably to me, is the fact that the biggest problem we have on college campuses are with students who call themselves liberal progressives. Now, what does it mean, uh, certainly in the American context, to be a liberal progressive? It means to be for things, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, women's rights, gay rights. I mean, that's liberal progressive values. And so you say to a student, where can you find all of those values protected? Where in the Middle East? There's only one place, Israel. And yet, those are the people who are most sympathetic to the Palestinians, where none of those values exist. And so it's incredibly frustrating when you, when you talk about values. Other students are more receptive to, to the idea, but American students are not, uh, by and large, ideological, especially at that age. I guess I don't mean ideology so much as, I mean, it was very striking to me in the summer during the 